back, guys. Hi, you can. Sorry, I'm late. I got comfortable and was trying to sleep. <laughs> well, I was sleeping and I woke up later than I planned on it. Hi, Dragon Voice. Hello? Hi, Dragon Voice. I know who I am. Ah. Ah. I watch the React stuff while I'm tired so you can get some. You're probably gonna giggle a lot. We'll go. West Hammer, I don't think I've watched a video by this person. Oh, we're finally focusing on the orcs. Crazy people. Where people keep liking to tell me. They're mushrooms. No, they're not! They're, they're fungi. They could be fungi, but they can't be mushrooms. Mushrooms are fixed. Mormon Lakai. I didn't yawn, should I? Orcs are better than humans in every conceivable way. At oh. least, that's a sentiment that's been argued by the Orc fans within the 40k community since the very beginning of the franchise. And on one hand, I get it. The Orcs are clearly having way more fun than everybody else in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, as it's a galaxy that's plagued by constant violence, and getting into a good scrap is what every Orc lives for. The Orc fans themselves seem pretty confident in this assertion that their particular favorite faction is better than all the rest. And as ridiculous as it sounds to everybody else, because we all know that the orcs are a bunch of rampaging hooligans that don't care about nothing but fighting, I have to admit that the orc players are pretty convincing. I don't know about you, but I've personally never met an orc player that I didn't immediately like. They just seem like much more well-rounded people, you know? At the very least, they have a better sense of humor and seem to be able to take a joke. But is all this just memes, or is there any truth to this idea? Are orcs actually better than humans? What are the fundamental differences between both factions? How are their societies structured? And is the orcs hierarchical system of, quote unquote, the biggest orc is the boss, actually superior to the intricate systems of authority found within the Imperium? What if we compare the average human to the average orc boy? Which one of them ultimately has a better life? Well, today we're gonna be getting to the bottom of that and a whole lot. That's a better life. What does that help? Aren't they both gonna die? It's grim dark, fantasy, fighting. More. So come with me as we dive headfirst into the grim dark and find out once and for all if orcs really are the best. They but are. Before we get into all that, I wanted to take a minute to tell you about Factor, the hey, sponsor actor. of this video. Dietitian orcs love fighting. Right so much so the Chaos God of War, who's named after chef. a vegetable, Using granted a group of orcs a realm of endless fighting. Variety, That's pretty nice. You can treat yours that are each ready with use code Westhammer50 to get 50% off your first. What about my box. noodles? Again, go to Factor. What about the noodles, John? What about the noodles? If you've been part of the Warhammer 40k community for Get any up. length of time, then you've Vinyan. definitely heard a top-tier orc enjoyer bragging about how orcs are objectively better than just about every other species in the galaxy, most importantly humanity. However, this idea is something that doesn't tend to go over too well with us smooth-brained Imperium and or Chaos simps, and we need a little bit more convincing. I'll fully admit I was one of them and had to do a pretty good chunk of research into this particular subject myself. But both humans and orcs on the surface seem to have different strengths and weaknesses. But are the weaknesses of the orcs actually weaknesses? Or has there just been a whole bunch of imperial propaganda that has distorted how we view the green skin menace? Well, in this video, we're going to be getting to the bottom of that. And to start the comparisons off, we should go with the obvious things first. with spikes on it. I don't know. <laughs> Such as that, that, that feels like it wouldn't and do much. This one's kind of a no-brainer. Physically speaking, the idea are superior to if the Emperor had a TTS device, way. watch alone. They are bigger, faster, already watched, stronger, we've been watching tougher, that. and most importantly, greener than humans. Orcs are incredibly it's resilient YouTube, and doctor. are able to shrug off devastating injuries that would surely kill a human being. Whether that be due to their incredibly thick skin that is difficult to puncture, a hyperdense skeletal system that is all but immune to breaks and fractures, or even a limited system of organs, each of which contributing to the overall well-being of the orc, but most importantly, none of them are critical to sustaining life. If a human being gets stabbed in the gut and one of our organs ruptures, if we do not receive immediate medical attention, it will probably be the end of our story. What I've noticed about orcs, they like to add machines to their body almost as much as the Imperium does. 
Not so with the orcs. Even if an orc suffers something as egregious as decapitation, it's been proven that a pain boy can reattach the head to either the body of the original orc or a donor with seemingly few complications. When it comes to how they eat, the orcs are omnivorous, and they can seemingly derive nourishment from just about anything. Most importantly, even if no regular food source is available, there have been many autopsies done on captured orc specimens that show that their bloodstream is full of countless different types of smaller fungal organisms that possess high chlorophyll content and aid in a rudimentary ability to undergo a form of photosynthesis. Meaning, as long as there is sunlight, an orc can go incredibly long stretches without consuming what we would consider to be food. This, coincidentally, also aids in their reproductive system. They're a plant? They're not even a mushroom, they're a plant. I think mushrooms here. Um, first of all, that doesn't work. That wouldn't work. System as they reproduce by shedding spores, which then grow into more orcs, Gretchen, or squigs, all of which can be used. Wait, what's a squig? Used as a viable food source for the orcs, meaning that even if a single orc was to show up on a barren <laughs> world with no food, the population would still increase exponentially as long as there was sunlight. There is a common notion that orcs are simply sentient mushrooms, and it's kind of a- They're not mushrooms! They could be fungi, but they can't be mushrooms. You leave my mushrooms alone. Grossly oversimplified meme that spread throughout the community, but there is a hint of truth to this. They're not just fungi or animals, they are a genetically engineered symbiosis of both kingdoms, taking together a diverse grouping of traits from both to create a particularly hardy and long-lived organism. They were engineered 60 million years ago by the Old Ones as a species of warriors, fighters built specifically and only for combat, and thus when we examine the bodies of the orcs, we can detect no signs of evolution. They are perfect in their design, and have remained that way for millions of years. Even the legendary Corks, super orcs that were said to be upwards of 30 meters tall from the days of the war in heaven, are something that the orcs of today are still genetically capable of becoming. And speaking of what an orc can turn into, we should look at how each and every one of them begins their lives. As I mentioned before, the orcs reproduce through spores. They're shedding them throughout the entirety of their life, and when they die, they release a particularly large amount of them all at the same time. These spores grow in the earth and then develop into more orcs. The gestation time can take only a couple of weeks, wherein the orc will be fully developed and rip his way out of his underground cocoon before bursting up from underneath the soil. This is what makes them incredibly dangerous and difficult to get rid of, as even if you manage to- I love that some of them have the like, what's it called? The punk aesthetic? With the little uh, potheads and stuff kill all of the orcs, there are still definitely going to be some spores behind that you missed. The novel Imperial Glory by Richard Williams gives us a rare peek into what it's like for an orc at the moment of their birth. The novel itself is a classic tale of the Imperial Guard versus the orcs, but in a segment between chapter 18 and chapter 19, the story suddenly shifts perspective and goes back in time one year before the events of the book. This is where we see the war boss known as Choppa at the moment that he tears himself free from his birthing pod. Before he even emerges, he's already fully conscious, and the only reason he decides to dig his way out in the first place is that he suddenly finds himself uncomfortable. The space that he has existed in for as far back as he can remember, which admittedly is only about a week, has always felt safe and secure. Now it's tight and cramped, and he doesn't like it and he wants out. He tears at the pod and then starts digging through the dirt. It's a weird sensation on his fingers as he's never touched soil before. Even when he starts to emerge from the ground, the feeling of wind against his skin is kind of unnatural and unnerving. Even more unnerving is the fact that he's never actually seen anything with his own eyes before, and opening them for the first time is an alien experience. The very first thing that he sees is another orc, and he recognizes immediately that this thing is stronger than him because it's physically larger. Already, he's inclined towards violence, and he realizes he needs to find something to make him stronger, which he does in the form of a large stick. He then proceeds to sneak large up on stick. the other orc and beat him to death. In the pursuing fight, he manages to strike the orc in the face with his club and sees a weird red liquid come out. But when the other orc hits him back, the same red liquid doesn't appear. He understands that this is a telltale sign that he's winning. 
After he defeats his opponent, he picks up his enemy's axe. He bites on it and tries to bend it, but no matter how hard he does, it doesn't flex. He really did the whole bite on it, the check of its real thing. I love that. <laughs> he was like, nang, nang, nang. must be real. <laughs> he realizes that this thing is stronger than his club, and thus by wielding it, he is now stronger. He bites it, the check of it's stronger. Stronger <laughs> than before. After this, he notices he's being watched by a Gretchen. He doesn't know what a Gretchen is, but he sees that it's smaller than him. Thus, he knows that he's stronger and gives chase. The Gretchen ends up leading him to a pack of squigs, and since they're territorial, they attack him on sight. He manages to crush one of them, and the other ones scamper off. There's this weird pain in his stomach. Not the same pain from before, where he got punched by the other orc, but it's something different, and he instinctively understands that by eating this squig, it will be relieved. After he eats, he goes back to sleep in his hole, and over the next several days, the Gretchen keeps coming back. Eventually, he follows the Grot to a camp of orcs, and although the Gretchen seems to be indicating that he wants him to go join the other boys, he's reluctant. There are more of them than him, and he understands that together they're stronger. Even still, he can't shake this deep sense of belonging, and he wants to be part of them. He goes back to his birthing grounds and sees another orc emerging from his cocoon. It's howling in pain as its leg has twisted at an unnatural angle. He sees the new spawn as weak and goes to kill it, but suddenly the Gretchen flies out of nowhere, clawing at him, saying that boys don't kill other boys. He seems confused, so thinking quickly, the Gretchen points at the new spawn and calls it a boy, and then points back at him and calls him the boss. He then points at the broken leg and tells him to dock it. Choppa doesn't really understand what he means, but he grabs the leg and wrenches it back together. Choppa would eventually join with the other boys, and over the next few weeks, he would learn his role within this society, even becoming their de facto war boss within only a year. So, what can we take away from this whole passage? The moment this orc is born... What can I take away from this passage? I need to bite weapons when I have time to make sure they're good. But I'm a dragon, I'll probably crush most of the weapons. But wait, maybe that'll mean I find more magic weapons. Hmm. I'll have to be sure not to break them. Also, if someone breaks her leg, I need to pull it. Pull it hard. He already has a rudimentary understanding of all of the things around him. He demonstrates propensity in a fight, making his first kill within 20 minutes of being born. He then learns what food is and how to hunt, and is successful in his very first attempt. He is like a sponge. Oh, that's a helmet. I was like, what, looking at that for a second. I'm like, wait a minute, what is that? Absorbing new stimuli. He's got the like punk aesthetic here with the what looks like racing pads and stuff with spikes like just welded on, I guess. Environmental factors and situations, and intuitively understand. Wait, is that skull to that helmet? Understanding <laughs> what they are and how to respond to them. He then integrates into orc society and very quickly rises through the ranks to become a powerful leader figure. This doesn't make sense. Oh wait, this one looks different. This one might be like an impact run. Almost all the orc units have now, boys in their names. Mech baby. boys, war boys, you, weird boys, really admit, small boys, really super boys, what it was like these boys, one, those boys, and all the, the boys. My parents are to be believed. I hadn't accomplished shit. We are remarkably useless for a pretty long period of time and are completely reliant on others to ensure our own survival. Orcs, on the other hand, are just built different. From a viewpoint that only focuses. I do have one question though. They seem to like having mouths up around their head. I don't know why that. Yeah, they seem to like having like teeth aesthetic around their head. On biology, we can see that the human belief in its own superiority is beyond just wishful thinking. It's blatantly incorrect. Another helmet! But being tough and hardy isn't everything. And many believe that intelligence is the true hallmark of greatness. So how do the orcs stack up against humans in the brains department? As we discussed in the previous section, not only are orcs able to adapt to new situations incredibly quickly, but they also each contain certain levels of innate wisdom encoded into them at a genetic level, giving them a remarkable understanding of not only survival tactics, but also physics, engineering, and medical science, just to name a few. On numerous occasions, they have left the Imperium completely baffled by their ability to come up with ingenious solutions to overcome just about any problem or obstacle that ends up in their way. 
whether that be by creating a system of underground drills to leech resources from their enemy, create vast arrays of void ships capable of sailing across the stars, or even producing reality-defying devices that can break the known laws of the universe. In fact, I feel like that's a part of their whole, like, imagination power. Is they can put together some stuff and be like, it totally does this, and it works. I would go so far as pointing out that when it comes to feats of engineering, humanity has yet to produce something that the orcs have not been capable of replicating. Whether it's titans, void ships, all manner of weapons, vehicles, or even warp drives, the orc version of these things might not look as pretty or be as intricately designed, but they not only work, but are made cheaper and faster. And whether it be based on the orc's inherent knowledge or a combination of that and their own personal discoveries throughout their lives, they actually know how their machines work. Convert oh, that was cool. I like the, like, colors and stuff. Why does he have a bear? <laughs> I love that there's, like, a castle up top. Like, do you live here? How do you live here when there's a giant gun inside? I like this. Looks kind of cool. I like, the, like, the colors in the... It's very fancy, and I like it. Although I, 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 the banners confuse me. Knowledge or a combination of that and their own personal discoveries throughout their lives, they actually know how their machines work. That's right, and there's tanks. They got multiple of those, though. Conversely, technology over in the Imperium is routinely based on blueprints from the time of the Dark Age of Technology, and humanity only has a base-level understanding of how they work in the first place, which has led over time to a cult of superstition developing around keeping them functioning through ritualistic prayer and sacrifice. If you know any one thing about how... I want to uh, understand that one. Like, where and how did you start thinking you had to sacrifice people to make it work? orc structure their society, then you'll know that, quote, the biggest orc is the boss. This is a fundamentally true statement, but the statement itself has much deeper meaning than what we get on the surface level. Why is the biggest orc the boss? Well, clearly, it's because he's bigger and stronger than all the rest. Thus, he's more likely to get his way, and any individual orc that would attempt to challenge him would probably get clobbered. But as I established before, the orcs are not stupid. Even if said orc is bigger and tougher than all the rest, the orcs are stronger together. And if at any moment they didn't feel like following the boss's orders, they could simply overpower them and elect a new boss. This isn't to say that that doesn't happen, as bloody disputes over who really is the biggest and toughest are a time-honored tradition. No, 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 that was Dragon just tries to understand human logic. Mm -hmm. Amongst the orcs. But if this is the case, and an entire group of orcs, or one particularly cunning boy that comes up with a really clever plan, could take the position of boss for themselves, why do they choose to follow any given individual? Well, let's examine that. The biggest orc is the boss. Orcs get bigger the more fights they get in. The orcs collectively understand this, so when they see an orc that is bigger than them, they're not following him out of fear, a sense of duty, or, if I'm being honest, not even really out of a sense of respect, either. It's because a large orc demonstrates a rare quality that is particularly attractive to the boys. This is an orc that can provide for them their entire purpose for existing. A good scrap. And not just one. If he managed to live long enough to get stuck in enough times to become war boss, then this orc has collectively seen more action than all of the other boys put together. In following such an individual, the orc in question is promised a number of fights exponentially higher than if he was to set out on his own. Thus, submitting to the will of the war boss is in his own selfish best interest. And I know what you're thinking. How can it be in their best interest if all of these battles are statistically likely to lead to the orc's death? And that's Humey thinking. You have to think like an orc. The outcome of the battle is not nearly as important as experiencing the battle itself. Char Ooh, some more good art. Headlong into the fray, whooping and hollering, swinging chain axes around, and mindlessly firing off volley after volley of Daka into the enemy is a highly desirable state of being for the orcs. It's more than just addictive, it's a biological need for them. And the orc boss himself is in a precarious situation. 
He isn't like a human leader that has badges, fancy medals, or some unearned sense of authority granted to him by some other dude. I do kind of like that aspect of the works is that they, they seem to know um they're not very like rebellious and stuff they're very they have clear notions of like what how do i say this like clear notions of who's in charge and even when th that's the case they also like aren't stupid so if boss ends up being stupid they just take him out they don't like wally gag around with even more fancy medals he can't just command his troops to do things they don't want to do that art was good with humanity being a soldier means doing exactly as you're told at all times even if that means putting yourself into highly undesirable situations that will most likely get you killed a state of being that every biological instinct is telling you to flee from but you and your comrades do it anyways held together by a sense of duty or oftentimes by an even stronger fear of the commissar behind you rather than the enemy in front of you. Thus, the soldier is a slave to the whirlwind of thoughts and emotions in his own mind. Statistically speaking, the human soldier is likely to follow a course of undesirable actions that will ultimately That's pretty good art. lead to their death rather than disobey orders from an authority figure. The orc boss, on the other hand, with no badge of office to derive some mystical sense of a Yeah, like that's the thing. The, the it's almost like, oh, he's bigger. He's been in more fights. He'll give me more fights. He's boss. Authority I like from, that. In turn, generates his authority by providing for his people exactly what they want, or risk taking a chain axe to the teeth. Even outside of battle, I love this art though. I'm getting like they super distracted. I'm tired of seeing pretty art. At, what specialties they have and what role they fill within their tribe's culture. No matter what they are or how old they get, they always have a purpose. There's also always room for upward mobility. If you're a particularly talented mech boy and you earn the respects of the orcs that enlist your services, you can build a bigger The majority and of shop. orcs are pretty dim-witted, but an orc war boss is usually pretty smart compared to the rest. To a large group of orcs do not fight without a war boss. Kill the war boss and the rest will retreat. Same goes for a pain boy in his clinic or any given boss under the war boss that wants to build a bigger and tougher mob. Hell, every single orc has equal opportunity to become a boss or the war boss. They just have to decide that that's what they want to do and take their shot. However, over in the Imperium, that's not normally the case for the vast majority of humanity. And it gets a little skewed, since most of the stories that we read from the 40k novels traditionally follow somebody who is an esteemed member of one of the armed forces that make up the Imperium. The reality is that ending up in such a position is incredibly rare, and it's normally the people who have gone through the prestigious military academies like the Scola Progenium. For 99.99999% of humanity, they are simply cogs in the Imperial War Machine. They are the workers that grind and toil away the day within the bowels of a hive city. What kind of outfit is that? Just to wake up and repeat the process again until they die. There are certainly more desirable places one could be born into. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Big castle. Like that of a pleasure world or an agri world. But these planets are far less numerous than the hive worlds and have ludicrously lower populations. If you were to roll the dice on being born into the 40k universe, it's like a 95% chance that you're going to end up doing backbreaking labor with no sense of fulfillment for the entirety of your life. And if you ever suffer tragedy that prevents you from doing your job, there might not be any other direction for you to go. There's actually a really great short story about Gregor Eisenhorn, the famous radical inquisitor, that highlights this pretty well. You see, one of his earliest cases after becoming an inquisitor saw him come face to face with an old man who came to his office of his own free will to turn himself in. The man was a savant with numbers and had been working for a local business and going over their ledgers when he found a number that didn't make sense. It more than didn't make sense. It shouldn't have existed. Whenever you tried to look at the pages, you knew something was wrong, but your eyes couldn't focus on it. He believed he had come across the number of ruin, a telltale sign of chaos. 
He's fully convinced that Eisenhorn is going to interrogate him and then either execute him or lock him up in some deep, dark dungeon for the rest of his days. But even still, he was a loyal son of the Emperor, and the idea of trying to cover it up to ensure his own safety was simply not on the table. Eisenhorn decides to investigate the matter much further, and by the end of the story, he has cleared the old man of any wrongdoing, having tracked the corruption back to the company he worked for. All of its higher-ups are tried, and the company is destroyed. Afterwards, the old man asks Eisenhorn what is going to happen to him. He was too old to learn a new skill, and nobody else in the city that he lived in had any need for somebody with his particular talents. He had enough rent money to get him through the next week, but after that, he didn't know what he was going to do. Oh no! Eisenhorn basically tells him that the Emperor protects and all that jazz, but he was on his own. Spoilers, but after the next couple of months, that old man was dead. He was oh. a toothless cog. There was no purpose for him to exist anymore within the Imperium, and thus he was allowed to perish. I should point out that this is an event that would end up haunting Eisenhorn and many years later would play a pivotal role in his journey of self-discovery where he re-examined all of the people that he had let down across his career. But that's a story for another video. Oh. Even in the worst case scenario where an orc boy suffers some kind of crippling injury where he's not able to fight anymore, he can simply go to a pain boy and they'll slap on another limb or two or three or four, whatever the pain boy wants to do. And if they're not fitting in with their- I love how they, they have such simple names. Their tribe, for whatever reason, they can just go and join another one. It's kind of weird to think about just how the orcs are often portrayed as being aggressive and dumb and brutal with each other, but they actually have a stronger sense of community than most humans do. To close this video out, I want to talk about orc and human society and the overall happiness and fulfillment levels of every single individual in each of them. To do this, we're going to take a look at a real-world psychological theory known as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. If you're unfamiliar with it, the basic concept is that Maslow believed human needs could be arranged in a five-tiered hierarchical system, wherein the needs at the bottom of the pyramid needed to be fulfilled before moving up to the higher ones. But each of them played an integral part into the overall happiness, well-being, and most importantly, purpose in life for any given individual. The five tiers of the pyramid can be broken up into two sections, the bottom two being deficiency needs, whereas the top three are growth needs. The bottom two layers are concerned with basic survival, and there's no budging on any of these. We won't survive long without air, food, water, rest, and shelter. Once those things are taken care of, the individual needs things that are going to guarantee that they continue to survive, like having a good state of health, being properly employed, and having some form of protection. The next three layers are equally as important and focus more on the psychological side of existence. They don't extend from the lack of don't something think that like the first applies two, to orcs. but more the desire to grow, improve our state of being, and ultimately reach our full potential. The third layer focuses on belonging and love. Humans are social creatures, so things like friendship, family, and intimacy are integral parts of our existence. I would kind of argue that that one's slightly lower in the tree. It's more important. I don't know, like, how you would arrange the the pyramid but i feel like that one's like super important as well it definitely makes sense why they put it third though after that, we have the self-esteem layer, which is focused on our own personal self-confidence, achievements we can be proud of, and seeing ourselves as unique individuals was something important to offer others. A oh, man. <laughs> And finally, at the very top is self-actualization, which is characterized by the idea of realizing what our potential is and then reaching it. It is to accomplish everything that we can and become everything we are capable of becoming. Whether that take the form of reaching physical perfection, mastering an area of study, or even something as simple as being a great parent. If we take the average human citizen within the Imperium and our run-of-the-mill orc boy from any of the clans and then compare and contrast how they stack up on the pyramid, the results are pretty depressing for humanity. Your average hab worker has the bottom two tiers fully taken care of, and they spend every minute of every day working in the manufactorums before returning to their habs to rest, and then rinse and repeat the process day after day until they die. They have all of those basic needs taken care of, but there's no guarantee for growth. When we read the 40k novels and we see regular imperial citizens, there's always this notion of bleakness just beneath the surface. Life sucks, and people know it. Yeah, that is one of the reasons that keeps me away, is the... I don't like bleakness. But they make the best out of what they have. Love and romance is a theme that almost never comes up in the books at all. 
it surely exists within the universe as characters will mention that they have a husband or wife or will have children, which is indicative that they at least at one point were in some form of relationship. I've read over a hundred of the 40k novels and within them, the amount of times I've seen intimate relationships between its characters, I can count those examples on one hand. And if I'm being honest with you, every single one of them ends in tragedy. When it comes to tragedy, to the needs of self-esteem, whether that be prestige or feeling like you're accomplishing something, we definitely see this a lot in the main characters within the books because we're often following somebody of military importance. They live a life of eternal duty and find worth in serving the God Emperor. There is no question that duty is an important and powerful generator of a sense of purpose and accomplishment, and it works out very well for these characters. But even though they are the ones the stories tend to follow, no! ending up in such a position is a remarkable rarity for the quintillions of humans that live within the Imperium. If you're somebody who plays the... Hmm. That's pretty hard. Is that the wing guy? It looks like the wing guy. The angel guy. Is he on a tank? 40k tabletop game, then you'll know that we as a community often make jokes about how the guardsmen are simply being sent into the meat grinder, that they're like ants, and their strength is that there are billions of them and they're all infinitely replaceable. It's not a very good look and paints kind of a dishonest picture of what the guard is. Getting accepted into the guard is incredibly rare and considered a huge honor for not only the individual, but for their friends, family, and sometimes even their entire town. They have been chosen for a higher purpose, to serve the Emperor and deliver his divine judgment across this blighted universe. And not only does this give them a sense of self-esteem, but also a sense of accomplishment and a community with their other soldiers. Even though life in the Guard is frequently portrayed as a truly awful existence where death is around every corner, from a mental health perspective, it's a lot better than what the majority of humanity has to endure. If we look higher up the hierarchy within the Imperium to things like commissars, inquisitors, interrogators, naval captains, generals, etc, etc, these are the characters the stories tend to focus on, and they give us a warped perception of what it's really like to- My question that keep popping up in my brain is why do these people have the- These have got to be like getting destroyed. Are they fighting in this with the paper all over them? Live within the Imperium. The reality is that even more so than just becoming a soldier within the Astra Militarum, ending up in a position like this is basically an impossibility for the teeming masses. Whether you're a farmer on an agri world, a manufactorum worker within a hive city, or you're an indentured servant on a pleasure world, this is likely all you will ever know. It's all your parents. Oh, well, that's pretty art. Where the floating skull coming from? ever knew and it's all your children will ever experience as well and if you cannot find your purpose in this then a life of crime may be your only escape and then the best outcome for you is that maybe you'll at least find peace when you're inevitably captured and lobotomized into a servitor by comparison, life as an orc is infinitely better. Your basic needs are taken care of by your tribe. You have a sense of community because you're one of the boys, a mad mob of hooligans out for a scrap and a good laugh. Your esteem is always sky high because orcs are the best. And as long as you're fighting, you're accomplishing something truly remarkable. Orcs fight to live and live to fight. And thus they have all become- I'm telling you, I love the grimdark aesthetic that they the orcs portray self-actualized but even if one of them does have bigger dreams of becoming I a boss a lot of people i know call it the mad max aesthetic or mm -hmm. even a war boss then all they got to do is be particularly brutal or particularly cunning and crump the other boss there's room for upwards mobility in any direction they could possibly want to go and if by some miracle they don't fit in with their particular tribe they can always just join another one Hell, that's the whole point of the Free Buddhas. It's a bunch of miscreants that didn't fit in anywhere else, so they became fucking orc space pirates. And space pirates! Die, they believe that there's no better way to go out than roaring across the battlefield in a high-speed dragsta, firing off volleys of Daka and screaming at the top of- So are Daka bullets? We did the Just Head stream a while ago. their lungs. The bigger the explosion that takes them out, the better. And then upon their death, they go to the Great Green and join with Gork and Mork. 
Humanity, on the other hand, is conflicted on their beliefs. Man has a weird nose ring. Even though the majority of them have had faith in the God Emperor forced on them by the Ecclesiarchy, and most of them do take comfort in that faith, the plague of doubt and chaos corruption are rampant throughout human society. Not so with the orcs. Not a single one of them has any doubt about their place in the universe, what life's all about, and where they're going to go. Aw, I was hoping to see another helmet somewhere. When they die. When comparing your baseline human to an orc boy, orcs just have... He seems like the happiest orc we've seen so far. He's just like, yay. He's like, mmm, I fire gun. Better lives. That's an undeniable fact. And if I was to roll the dice on being born in the 40k universe, I sure do hope I'd be born as an orc. Because every other alternative sounds like a hellish existence. That is, unless I got born as a Gretchen. If we're talking about Grotz, then you can literally take everything I said in this entire video and throw it out the window because their lives are the worst. But what are your thoughts on all this? Do you think the orcs are really as intelligent as I've made them out to be? Or do you think they're just a pack of big dumb brutes that are obsessed with fighting? How do you think they stack up against humanity? Which society do you think is better and which would you personally rather be a part of? Also uh, I'm a dragon. I'll, I'll continue to be a dragon. Thank you. So, what's your favorite piece of orc lore or bit of technology that you find particularly ingenious? I read all of your comments and I try to reply to as many of them as I can, as nerding out about Warhammer with you guys is my absolute favorite thing to do. Anyways, huge thanks to everyone who that supports was pretty the good, work that though. I do, and I, I love the art. The next one. I think the art distracted me so much. It was so pretty.